it was more than a hockey game. It was us against them. It was freedom versus communism. Nobody gave us a hope in Halloween. It was a sliver of the Cold War played out on a sheet of ice. Here you have a bunch of fresh-faced college kids taking on the big, bad Soviet bear in the United States, in the Olympics. The confluence of events was so extraordinary, it can never happen again. Nobody paid attention to what Americans said in the world anymore. Our hostages had been taken, and we couldn't get them back. The Red Army went into Afghanistan. We couldn't get them out. It might have been the all-time low point for American public self-esteem. Who knew that these kids would become the vehicle for making people feel excited and proud again to wave a flag? It was a miracle. David slew Goliath. It was the greatest sports moment of the 20th century. At the end of the 70s, American amateur hockey was suffering the same malaise as the nation itself. In the 20 years since winning the gold medal at the 1960 Olympics, American teams had become increasingly unable to compete with the dominant Europeans, especially the Soviet Union, whose players were amateurs in name only. The Americans were always amateurs, college kids, some of them, or recent graduates who still played the game, but certainly not at the, at the Russian level. There was no way that they could be competitive. And the feeling going into 1980 was they really haven't got much of a chance, even though it's here in Lake Placid. The goal was to avoid being embarrassed at home. So in July of 1979, the best amateur players in the country were invited to try out for the 1980 Olympic team. They invited us all to Colorado Springs, and they divided us up into four teams, basically Eastern guys, Michigan guys, Minnesota guys, and an at-large team. Over the course of 10 days in Colorado Springs, those four teams played a round robin. It was a nerve-wracking situation. It was a, a pressure-packed situation. And, and as that tournament went on, it was being evaluated by Herb Brooks. Mike, heads up, Mike. Herb Brooks never went to charm school. Get it off, get it off, quick. If he had, he would have flunked out. How would you have called a hook on that stand? He was abrasive. There's two teams playing this same stand. Intense. Right, JC hooked him. Get in that game now, will you? He was also the best college hockey coach in the country. People were a little afraid of him. He'd always been considered kind of an outsider, had his own way of thinking, his own way of doing things. And he had a history with the Olympic team. As a University of Minnesota player, Brooks thought he had made the team in 1960. He was even in the team picture. But at the last minute, coach Jack Riley added a new player to the roster, and someone had to go. The someone was Herb Brooks cut just one day before the team left for the games. Back home in Minnesota, Brooks watched with his father as his old teammates beat Czechoslovakia and won America's first gold medal in ice hockey. When we won it, my father looked over and says, well, looks like Coach Riley cut the right guy, didn't he? So, a true story, and I, you know, it sort of hit me right between the eyes. That left unfinished business in Herb Brooks' life. He had something to prove. He was on a mission. A mission to shake American hockey out of its slumber. First, Brooks had to trim the roster from 80 to 26. So he began by keeping the players he knew best, ones who had helped him win three NCAA championships at the University of Minnesota in the 70s. They included Mike Ramsey and Bill Baker, Neil Broughton and Rob McClanahan, Eric Strobel and Buzz Schneider. But Brooks knew he couldn't be provincial. Herb wanted to make sure that it didn't look like a Minnesota team because he was from Minnesota. He wanted to make sure there was a good balance. So Brooks looked eastward to another college hockey powerhouse, Boston University, where he got Jack O'Callaghan, a defenseman with an attitude, and Michael Ruzioni, whose name in Italian means eruption, perfectly fitting his personality. To fill the most important role, 
Brooks picked 22-year-old Jim Craig, who'd been playing goaltender since he began skating on the frozen ponds of New England. I started to play goal because I didn't know the rules. And I figured, you know, it's not too hard. He's just supposed to keep that puck out of the net. He kept the puck out of the net as well as any amateur goaltender around, but spent his college years playing with a broken heart following the death of his mother, Margaret, from cancer. His father, Donald, took the loss extremely hard. I think when my mother passed away, a piece of my father left. He was so lost. He was a shell of himself. I, I think death and the tragedy of that brought us really, really close together. I spent a lot of time with Jimmy. I talked to Jimmy an awful lot. Jimmy was the guy in my mind that I thought we had to put the saddle on. Brooks filled out the team with gritty players like Mark Johnson, from the University of Wisconsin, John Harrington and Mark Pavlich from Minnesota Duluth, Kenny Morrow from Bowling Green, and tapped others, mostly from colleges in the upper Midwest. They were tough and fast and disciplined, but compared to the world's best, the players who were called amateurs, but in reality played hockey for a living, the Americans were just a bunch of kids, not feared and not respected. We were by far the youngest, most inexperienced team when it came to the Olympic Games. We were just college kids playing flat out professional, older, stronger, better, you know, athletes. So it was a real formidable task. Behind the Iron Curtain, another intense coach was preparing his team for Lake Placid. But Viktor Tikhonov didn't have any of Herb Brooks's problems. The Soviets were the best hockey team in the world, and everybody knew it. So Tikhonov's goal was simple, to return home to Moscow with his nation's fifth straight Olympic hockey gold medal. That his own players despised him meant nothing. I would say he was a fanatic, thinking of hockey 24 hours per day. He wanted that the Soviet Union or Russia will be number one everywhere and anywhere. And he wanted that every player who plays for him will think the same way. The players hated him big time. The life was intense, practically without family, children, or hobbies. It was only work. Vladislav Tretiak grew up just outside of Moscow and became immersed in the Soviet sports machine at a young age. He developed into perhaps the greatest goaltender to ever play and starred on the Soviet national team for over 15 years. We lived in camps for nine months out of the year. We trained, studied theory, and practiced three times a day. It was a difficult and harsh life. I saw my wife and children rarely. But the thing is, I loved hockey very much. I thought that's the way it should be, and I was ready to sacrifice and put discipline ahead of everything in order to be first and for my team to win. Tretiak and his teammates were first, year after year. Their lives and careers were controlled by the Soviet government because technically, they were soldiers in the Red Army, but only technically. I went from a private to lieutenant colonel, but didn't do any army stuff. For the most part, we were fully devoted to hockey. By 1980, Boris Mikhailov was already a 10-year veteran of the Soviet national team and the most recognizable face in international hockey. Sport. Sport was tied with politics, and any victory had big political undertones, especially during the Olympic Games, when the general secretary and everybody else was worried about how we would represent our country. Our task was only to place first. Mikhailov and his teammates represented the Soviet Union by demolishing just about anyone who got in their way. They were government-sponsored magicians on ice, who had been dominating international hockey since the darkest days of the Cold War. It was a dynasty, definitely, for 10, 20, 30 years. Their main goal was to win in every game, every period, every shift. And it was one regular season when they won 43 out of 44 games. 64, 68, 72, 76, right up until 1980, the Soviets were unbeatable in the Olympics. They played hockey the way we played basketball with the same kind of control of the puck, the same kind of intricate offensive patterns, and of course the presence and goal of Tretiak, how could you beat him? Back in the U.S., Herb Brooks had been contemplating that same question for years. They could execute at such a high 
level of speed, skating, passing, shooting, thinking. I tried to develop a team that would throw their game right back at them. Starting in August of 79, Brooks began employing his main team building exercise, beginning a rugged six-month pre-Olympic training program with a strategy. To bond them as a team, his players needed one common enemy, him. Herb always liked that, where it would be you against him. You know, he was the bad guy. He liked being in that bad guy role. I remember when he told us, I'll be a coach, but I won't be a friend. And I'm like, wow, this is going to be a long year. Herbie threw compliments around like manhole covers. He quoted in the paper that I had a million dollar set of legs and a 10 cent fart for a brain. He could give you that glare and that look, and it's like, oh my god, what did I do wrong now? I can honestly say that uh, there was no sense of regionalism on that team. There was a sense of Herbieism. And if Herbieism had a language, it could be found in a tiny notebook the players secretly kept, documenting each moment their coach began to sound like a cross between Yogi Berra and Casey Stengel. The players called his strange motivational sayings Brooksisms. A couple of my favorite Brooksisms on our team, you don't have enough talent to win on talent alone. There's a fine line between guts and brains. You look like a monkey screwing a football, whatever that meant, I'm not sure. Ramsey, you're playing, you're playing worse and worse every day, and right now you're playing like it's next week. Carrington, you're playing worse every day, and right now you're playing like the middle of next month. Christoph, you suck. You know, you're getting worse every day, and today you're playing like next month. I mean, that was a, that was a tip. But he was right. And his strategy was working. Herb Brooks was transforming them into a team. Our Olympic team got very tight with the idea that it was us versus him. And we're constantly, as a group, trying to prove to him that we're good enough to play. It was Herbie bashing from day one until the final day of the Olympics. It, it really made them a unit. As September arrived, it was time to start playing against future Olympic competition. So Brooks took the team to Europe for a series of exhibition games. The Americans started out strong, winning six of their first eight. But Brooks kept pressing. Before a game against Norway, a team they would have to face at the Olympics, he issued a challenge. I said, guys, we're going to have to play the Norwegians in qualifications. So we do it tonight. We send a message right now. But playing flat and uninspired hockey, the U.S. could only muster a 3-3 tie. And Brooks was furious. As we went to get off the ice, Herbie ran from the bench down to the gate and said, stay out on the ice. Steam's coming out of his ears. He's so hot that we had tied Norway, which was the weakest team we had played over there. If that's all we can do is tie the Norway national team 3-3, and you think you're going to go to the Olympics and be successful, you got another guest coming. He's standing there with his suit on, and he makes us all get behind the net and on the goal line, and he starts blowing his whistle. And we did what are called Herbies, which are blue line back, red line back, far blue line back, all the way down and back. Two or three of those would be tiring. Blue line back, red line back, blue line back, down and back. Ten or twelve of them would be excessive. <laughs> and we did them for about 45 minutes to an hour. The rink attendant turned the lights off on us, and we still skated in the dark. In the dark, he's screaming at us. Booming voice around this empty arena, you know. It was pretty intense. The message went out right then. They're not going to play the game like that and disgrace their abilities or our collective efforts. No one knows exactly how many Herbies were done that night, but to the players, it was a turning point. And that moment probably had more to do with us gelling as a team, feeling like we were a group, a family. We looked at each other and said, you know, basically he can do anything he wants to us. He's not going to break us. Returning from Europe, the team continued its grueling schedule of competition in the United States, and they went on a tear, winning 30 of their 41 games through the fall of 1979. Around Christmas time, we played in a pre-Olympic tournament in Lake Placid. We played the Russian national B team, who were pretty darn good. And the Americans beat the Soviet junior varsity team 5-3, to three, winning the tournament and gold medals to go with it. But the smiles on their faces hit an uneasy feeling on the team. Because despite all the wins, Herb Brooks wasn't satisfied. I didn't like our, our team then. I didn't like the, the chemistry of our team.